Um, welcome to Ethnic Space. Today we inaugurate actually our lecture series in this space, and that is because our um, traditional ground floor laboratory of uh, lectures and events has been literally transformed into a laboratory. So all our digital fabrication machines have now been um, brought together to have more power and also more space uh, for all of the students, but also the faculty, the researchers, and uh, to be able to produce um, in a much more organized and, and yeah, obviously uh, advanced way. Okay, yeah, thank you. So um, I'm really, really happy today uh, that we have with us um, Mark, Mark Berry. Um, there are very few things probably that um, we're able to say about Mark. He's um, an incredible figure. He's an incredible figure in our uh, discipline of architecture, but he's also an incredible figure in always pioneering um, what comes next in relation to uh, novel design, um, novel ways of combining design, computation, fabrication, um, a very huge rigor on trying to combine theory with practice. And um, he has been all over the world always very prominent um, uh, person of leading um, ways for others to follow, I would say. Uh, in the, I mean, Mark, somebody would say that you're Australian. Are you? <laughs> you are Australian. But Mark has been based in Barcelona for many, many years. Um, he has been commuting um, between Barcelona and Melbourne, which is something that is not very, very, uh, normal to do, but uh, Marco's doing it for almost 37 years. Um, he's uh, currently uh, the lead and the director of the Sustainable uh, Build Initiative, Sustainable uh, Build Environment Initiative at uh, Swinburne in Melbourne. And um, I'm really happy to see that every few years, Mark always tries to change what he's doing and also the, the ways that he paves. Uh, in this new initiative, they're working on trying to bring innovation to communities that do not have access to um, not only novel tools, but not have access to, you know, financial affordances. And um, um, through innovation, they are trying to create ways of empowering these communities to create their own buildings, sustainable, accessible, but also innovative buildings in different remote areas. Um, in the world. Uh, before that, he has been a founding member of the Smart Cities Research Institute, again at the Swinburne. Now you direct the IHAP, which is the Urban Research Initiative at Swinburne. He's always in between the urban, uh, the building, um, and the code, maybe. <laughs> Um, he has been, as I was saying uh, before, for 37 years uh, commuting between Barcelona and Melbourne because he has been the chief architect of Sagrada Familia. Um, I guess when he entered, very few people knew about what digitization is in architecture and design. He also himself entered in order to try to understand how we can create analog ways on... on um, understanding, let's say, the logics of um, uh, Gaudi in, in building this masterpiece or in non-building it, but uh, designing it and, and losing half of the design. So one of his major role was also to try to understand what's the design behind that or how can we use the tools that we have today to interpret um, what the design would be. Uh, he has been one uh, of uh, the few people that in... Um, what was it, 1990 um, was working with code and parametric design in Sagrada Familia. He brought digitization. I remember when I was a student back here many, many years back, I did a visit to Sagrada Familia and I saw the first 3D printer inside the Sagrada Familia because it was not only about design, but also try to understand how rapid prototyping could inform design. Uh, and then um, after 37 years, he actually um, became an expert on, on um, uh, Gaudi's logics, but he's also an expert on um, merging creative design with digital technologies. And one of these digital technologies is artificial intelligence. We have been discussing with Mark a lot of how AI would have impacted the work of Gaudi or we will 
impact the way that we think in the way that we design. So he decided today to do a very peculiar talk. I will leave the floor to him to explain all about that, but it's all in the title as well. How might AI have helped us learn from Gaudi surviving models? Um, and um, just to finish by saying, Mark is also a faculty at IAC for many years now. He's leading a seminar um, on um, merging computational design with logics of Gaudi, both in design and manufacturing. And I think that this has always been a great experience of students, having him as a professor, but also as a hands-on person. Um, and he's a very good friend. So Mark, th many thanks for being here with us. And the floor, the sofa, and the microphone is yours. <coughs> Thank, thanks already. That was a very long, fluent um, bi biography. The only thing I will, because I know I'll get held up on it, I was never chief architect. I was um, senior architect. Yeah, that, that, I don't, don't know what it means. But um, well, welcome, everybody. Um, that's the title. Um, I'm not going to talk. What I'm doing in my sort of main job, I'm not going to really talk to tonight. There should be some time. Um, there should be some time at the end for questions if people are interested in, in where it's all going. Um, I apologize for any of you who've seen me talk about Gaudi before, because you're going to see a lot of the same stuff, but in a slightly different context, I hope. Um, so uh, I plan to speculate a little bit on AI. Uh, I'm one of the people who feel that AI is a good thing. I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, uh, it makes me puts me in a position of getting more out of my working day, and that's I don't feel challenged by it in any kind of worried way. Um, so I'm going to sort of that's my kind of uh, overtone. And the reason why I'm quite confident about it uh, is it's going to this is put the sound off. Uh, I'm quite confident about it is because I I. I've worked with lots of creative people, including the kind of the shadow of Gaudi, and I've sort of seen creativity at its finest, and it doesn't seem to need any agency, uh, and that's what I really want to sort of talk about with Gaudi. What what on earth would he have done with AI had he had it? Because that's a used to specul speculation, but us poor fools who have been in his footsteps trying to unpack his secrets. Um, would we have had a better go at it with AI? Well, I'm going to show you a few things and you can make your own opinion on that. I'm actually going to plunge into the sofa, which means I'll <laughs> disappear from view, but it's all visual. Um, so you don't have to worry. I I'm just going to be gurgling from down here. Um, we maybe we can put the lights out, I guess, and I'll get, get going. You, you can hear me at least. Um, I can hear myself about half a second later on my laptop. Is there anything I can do about that? Because it's, it's, not, it's not my thing. I, did, I tried that. One, two, one, two. One, two. No, it's still, no, it's still coming out. Yes. Oh, don't go and escape. Escape, so you cannot disturb the thing right now. Okay. Yeah, okay, don't matter. Let's get this out of the way. And yeah, or maybe it's function. Is it function? Where is that? Yeah. Come on, yeah. Okay, uh, this, this isn't a blatant plug for a book. Um, it's, um, it's more to do with the fact that I wrote it in 2011. And it was at a time when I was very curious about the, the fact that people were learning to code uh, in architecture. And I wanted to know who was using code creatively and who was using code simply to get more out of their day by being more productive. So um, the, the, some of the ideas that I expressed here um, 
The view that I'm most comfortable with is that of the idea being propagated in the mind and substantially worked into the design into a design for a purely intellectual processes, which may or may not derive computational support. So this is early on in the book. I'm making a stand saying, look, what I'm going to talk about with, with computational design, it's not promoting it as something that will replace anything. And um, I also go on, uh, I'm, I am, however, particularly attracted to the situation where a computational support is used to steer the design towards complex simplexity, being enlisted as an external agent to counter the human tendency towards complexification. And then the book goes on and on. <clears throat> um, it's in lots of different chapters. Uh, and why I'm talking about this now is because it's interesting. This is only 13 years ago, and it's no longer, who, who cares about coding? In fact, you don't even need to code. You can just do it in chat GPT if you feel so inclined. So obviously, um, AI is the thing that will, if I was writing books now, I would be busy trying to find ways to um, speculate on AI. Um, and there, I, have, I have done some chapters uh, on the topic with um, colleagues who know lots more than me about it, but I, I, I feel comfortable uh, immersing myself into its possibilities. Um, conceptual development uh, from an idea has been a clearly defined process in my experience. And this is the important bit. Whilst many in a team might have the same idea, someone will have it first. From that point, once the idea is shared, its development into a concept will almost certainly involve other people. How those people are organized within the team, that is the hierarchy is traditionally evolved around experience. So I think if I was writing that now, I would put something about AI in there. But the the power of the idea, I don't see it coming from the computer for a while yet. I think the conceptualization uh, that comes from an idea, which teams do often based on someone else's idea, may well have uh, AI agency. So um, it's the you know it's the theme at the moment. Uh, in 2000, so that's like quarter of a century ago, the theme of the moment was plastic architecture. That's not architecture made from plastic, but plastic in its sculptural term. You know, the idea of uh, form being very fondant, very uh, non-Euclidean. And so this quote has always been very important to me. Uh, the new architecture is open. The whole structure consists of a space that is divided in accordance with the various functional demands. This, demand, this division is carried out by means of dividing surfaces in the interior or protective surfaces externally. The former, that's the interior surfaces, um, separate the various functional spaces and they may be move, movable. That is to say, the dividing surfaces, which in this case would have been called interior walls, may be replaced by movable intermediate surfaces and panels. And the same method may be employed for doors. Now, in architecture's next phase of development, so we'd say in architecture's next phase of development, AI will dot, dot, dot. But in this case, in this manifesto towards plastic architecture, their, um, <clears throat> their, their hypothesis or their proposal is that in architecture's next phase of development, the ground plan must disappear completely. The two-dimensional spatial composition fixed in a ground plan will be replaced by an exact constructional calculation, a calculation by means of which the supporting capacity is restricted to the simplest but strongest supporting points. For this purpose, Euclidean mathematics will be of no further use. But with the aid of calculation that is non-Euclidean and takes into account the four dimensions, everything will be very easy. Now, what's remarkable about this quote is it was very applicable in 2000. Just, just having my coffee is not just a dramatic effect. So. It might have been um, topical in 2000, but actually, for those of you who haven't come across it, it was written in 1924, so 100 years ago, by Theo van Doesburg. And this gives me great comfort, um, because uh, I, I was warned off looking at Gaudi seriously when I was a student, because he seemed to be um, out to lunch. It's a technical term, I think, and not um, someone who had any lessons for the future. And um, I'm actually from New Zealand, although I'm, I live in Australia and have been living there for a very long time. And New Zealanders, particularly Australians to an extent, are colorblind to the extent if they see a green light, 
they think it's red and they might be cautious, but certainly if they see a red light, it's a green light. If you're told not to do something, that's the biggest implication to get, get busy. So I got very busy in um, trying to work out why Gaudi was being, why I was being warned off him when it seemed that he had a lot to offer. Um, I went to the Sagrada Familia in 1979 and found that it hadn't been abandoned as it had been explained to me, but was actually well on its way with the second group of towers just being completed. And so I asked um, what um, was going on and they said, well, it's um, time we start doing the main body of the um, basilica, which is the nave. And uh, I had the good fortune of meeting the two directors, both of whom were almost 90, and had collected money as crowdsources to drive the project when they were young architects in exchange for Gaudi giving lectures in um, the basement, in the crypt of the Sagrada Familia where he slept. And um, I, the two questions famously, from my point of view, were, you know, where will the authority to continue? It'd been trashed during the Civil War and um, the, all the drawings burnt. And, uh, and anyway, even if they felt they had authority, when somebody rocks up to work with the hammer and their chisel and there's a large piece of stone in front of them, how on earth do they know what to do to the stone to get it into position on the building? And they said to me, you know, these are the problems that Gaudi was confronting in the last 12 years of his life. He abandoned secular work. He was only working on the basilica and he also um, rethought his process. And he had explained to these two young architects at the time what the process entailed, uh, but he never said how they would use it because they never got to a point where the new, the new approach, the new paradigm was going to be applied. Uh, and they said, you know, if you're interested, you could come here as an intern and um, we are just going to move on to this phase. And that's what happened. I, I went there and I'm going to explain the process. But first of all, I want to, tell, want to sort of start off with looking at Gaudi the failure uh, because he had of out, four outcomes. Uh, I love asking people what is park well and the smart ones in the class will put their hand up and say it's a park. And I say, no, it isn't. It's a failed gated community. There are only two of the 60 houses that are supposed to be there built. A few of the client and all your money had gone into that amazing infrastructure and park, but you didn't actually get the houses. And another uh, failed um, building is this one, which I argue is Gaudi's most, um, his best work, but not his most important. His most important work for me is the Basilica because that is the one building that shows him transitioning from being a sculptor to being an architect. I think for the first 30 years of his life, he wasn't really working as an architect. He almost got away with it, some of the buildings, but buildings like this one, he didn't. So it's very famous, we know why it is, but it's a four dimensional building. It's skipping non-Euclidean -Euc uh, uh, space. It's gone straight to four dimensions. This is a, um, a parametric, design model, happens to be analog. You just move the little bags of weight which represent the um, weight of the building and the, the model, model shifts its shape. And this took eight years to make. So Gaudi was going to site once or twice a week and was making adjustments to the little bags of birdshot. Um, and after eight years, they put some sailcloth inside it and uh, photographed it. But in this case, um, the model was upside down. So he's having to model the building in a very precise way. Um, there were tensometers. So at the main um, structural lines, the forces were being measured. Uh, so um, very clever uh, structurally, um, very scientific. Um, and there's the outcome. So he had to think in reverse and turn the model upside down, photograph it, and then paint it. And after eight years, this is what the client got. Um, you know, after eight years, they might have felt that they deserved sort of some insight on where's, how's the project doing? Well, it's finished. It's, this, this is what it looks like. It's a photograph that's been painted over. And, oh, what's it look like inside? Well, that's, you put apparently put a camera inside and photographed it. And on that basis, the building proceeded. Uh, the model itself, the analog, the design computer, one scale of one to 10, lived on site right next to the where the building was built. Obviously, it was upside down, but measurements were taken from it because every single structural element is actually 
bowing to the force of gravity in the sense that it's leaning into it. So basically, whenever you see a, a vertical column, you should snigger because in all probability, it's not taking forces axially down the center. It's probably overstructured. Gaudi realized this and knew that if you wanted um, structure to be at its most efficient, then it must follow the forces of gravity. Whatever's happening in tension is, is, uh, is going to be the uh, opposite in compression. And there is this most remarkable space. I'm amazed at how many people uh, haven't been into it. Uh, if it's a public lecture, I'm not going to go out for shaming. But um, I think there'll be a lot of people in this room who ought to have been to this building but haven't. And it's not that difficult. In the old days, it was very difficult because it wasn't even open. So you had to go and um, you know, persuade um, the caretaker to, to, to open it up. That's if you ever got there. Um, but now there's a train that's every 20 minutes or so. So no excuses. Um, and, and you go into the space. I, I you know, first saw it over 40 years ago, and it still has the same extraordinary effect. When I look at this and know that there's no concrete, no steel, no tricks, um, it's just um, Catalan building techniques taken to the absolute nth degree, plus a lot of Gaudi on top. The columns are natural. They're not nothing. They're not, they haven't been cut. The, the length and their shape is it's exactly how they come out of the side of the cliff. So they're basalt. Uh, he's recognised that the building is going to be equilibrated when it's finished. In other words, all the forces will be perfectly aligned. But when, when it's unfinished, it's, it's going to be um, unequilibrated. So he's got an, a, a couple of centimetres of lead in between the columns. He felt the columns actually might have gone a bit over the, over the top and they were overstructured. So he asked for the stonemasons to take these scarfs out of each of them, which gives an incredible tension when you see them, especially if you know the story that he had to stand underneath the column while the stonemasons did it. To, but what I mean, how many people do you know have that degree of chutzpah that they would look at their column and decide it's overstructured and uh, ask for a bit to be whittled out of it? Um, uh, but trouble is, after six years, that's 14 years into the project, all we have is the basement, uh, technically known as the crypt, and that's most likely all there'll ever be because after 14 years it was abandoned. Um, there are lots of things about this building uh, that makes it uh, particularly, you know, in, in, you know, intellectually, not just viscerally amazing. And it's the fact that he started looking at something called doubly ruled surfaces. And doubly ruled surfaces are surfaces that have at least two straight lines lying on the surface going through any point. And there are only three such surfaces. There's the plane. Any point on the plane has an infinite number of straight lines lying on the surface going through the point. But there's also the hyperbolic paraboloid, which is what we're looking at here, and the hyperboloid revolution of one sheet. I'll talk about it a little bit more, but I'm really wanting to talk about the AI. But here I'm focusing on the human intelligence of someone realizing that he needed to get his act together if he wanted to be a, a sculptor working on sculptures that are the size of basilicas, because he was having difficulty getting his work finished. Um, and time and on budget. This building was modest, so you're looking at um, intersected hyperbolic paraboloids and whole hyperbolic paraboloids, but you're also looking at um, the most modesty, the most modesty you could find in the use of materials, I imagine. These bricks are following the lines of forces, which are the strings in the model. The infill is just a recycled brick that would otherwise have gone into road fill. And then these amazing windows are made from the discarded needles from the factory. This little chapel was supporting the community of workers at the, at the Cordroy factory. Needles wear out, but instead of being thrown away, they were made into this mesh. All right, skipping quickly to what did Gaudi do about it? This idea that he had Casa Mila was also a disaster. Um, that's La Pedrera. It was supposed to be very... Um, uh, festooned with, uh, with, with messages of, from the Bible with the, um, the Virgin Mary right at the top. I think I have a couple of shots. I can just make that point. Oh, it's, it's important. So this is, this is the building as Gaudi planned it to be. And this is what it built. You can see that um, 
you can see that what was meant to be here is it, it was never was never made. That was a, a Carlos Mani was going to do uh, this huge sculpture of the, the Virgin Mary surrounded by angels. Uh, there was a kind of religious anti-religious movement in the 19, early 1907, I think, and the, and the tragic week, and the client did not want Gaudi to proceed, and it led to um, this amazing voluptuously sort of organized interior hitting what Greg Lynn once described as contractor space, which is the reality. So this is as built, if you can see the difference. That's what Gaudi wanted to do, these sort of cave-like rooms. And this is what was built. He had to straighten it out. So these, I'm offering all this as evidence that Gaudi was struggling at some of the kind of uh, aspects of what, what an architect is supposed to do. Um, and he also, this this famous, I mean, this is Gaudi having a fight with the client. By the time the, the La Pradera was finished, um, it was way over budget. It was, um, and it had also left the zeitgeist of the modern Easter period. And we're now into now Centisma, which is a kind of classical revival. And the poor client found that this speculative block of flats by the most... Um, uh, illustrious architect of 1900 by 1913 thereabouts when the building was finished uh, had um, it was the opposite it was being it was being ridiculed in public so in 1914 Gaudi found himself um, very ill with brucellosis and confined to a bed in the Pyrenees for several weeks months actually I'm only speculating but I'm imagining a, with a bit of transfer and a bit of projection if it was me with these buildings behind me and the Sagrada Familia just really emerging out of the ground, even though I've been working on it since 1882, I'd be, and uh, no longer getting any work from um, secular clients, I'd be looking at the ceiling wondering what on earth I was going to do if I was spared from the brucellosis. He's aged 62. So for the next 12 years, he um, invested in, in thinking about a, a way of working that involved uh, algebra and geometry. So those are my first two bosses, um, and uh, and they they were the people that I reported to, and so they were able to say to me the answer to the question I I get I you know I asked them, you know where was the authority coming from? Well, the authority was coming from a bunch of models that had been smashed to pieces during the Civil War, but had been pain, painstakingly collected and restored which might be enough in itself if you think you could just pull information from them. But uh, the fact was that they knew that these models had been composed of these um, doubly ruled surfaces. And the characteristic of the surfaces that's important is that if you can describe a surface through a selection of straight lines in space, it's very easy, relatively speaking, to speak to a, a stonemason and give them the guidance that they need to convert a piece of stone into a useful component. And here's the evidence. Here's a little piece of model. You can see the straight lines. See how that's, if you had a, a, a ruler and just rested it there, you'd find it would be gliding past that surface without rocking. It's an amazing thing. If you just rock a, a straight edge against one of these surfaces, it suddenly locks, literally goes, it just snaps into place, but in two directions. Because you can see that straight line here. There's also a straight line here. That's the second one that does this. So that means as long as the, the uh, person making this object has uh, a representative set of lines to work from, they can actually um, uh, make this relatively easily. And Gaudi, like all others in his uh, uh, cl uh, class and his time, would have devoted one-sixth of his studies to descriptive geometry. And one of the things I love um, teaching at EAC is that there's always people in the class who've come from schools around the world uh, unkindly, I'll say the schools focus on teaching students how architects used to work, um, where, as opposed to a progressive school, which is supposed to be looking at how we will work in the future. But one of the advantages of schools that teach students how architects used to work is that they also have uh, ge descriptive geometry as part of the program. I hope, hope there's people in the room who know what I'm talking about. But unfortunately, a lot of people in the room won't have ever heard of it, which is um, their loss, I guess. But Moving on, here is the hyperboloid of revolution of one sheet, as its full title. Uh, everybody in Gaudi's year would have seen this on page 52. 
Um, but only Gaudi, I would say, stopped on it and it, it stuck with him as being of interest. And there you can see a physical model of it. That's a 3D model showing the, the, um, the hyper hyperboloid revolution. And here is a parametric model from the 18 something or others, so the 19th century. Um, the hyperboloid of revolution uh, is formed from parametrically. It's a four-dimensional surface in conceptually because it could be a cylinder until you actually lock one of these um, rings in place and move the other one, pulling the lines with it. So there you can see the doubly ruled surface, right? It's emerging. And if you, you know, it's great. You can say that's looking pretty good. That's looking pretty un, not particularly useful. Uh, if you go all the way, sorry, you get a cone facing a cone, right? And if you take it out, it's a cylinder. So that model I showed you is um, that actually physically could do that. You could, I, I, it's, it's a photograph from a book. I've never actually played with it, so I can express disappointment, but I think I'd have a lot of fun because if I did, I know that those yellow um, strings would start pulling one direction and the green, the red ones would unwind and um, and you'd get the, you get the, this shape, right? Now, I, again, I'm hoping some people haven't a clue what I'm talking about because uh, one of the things I like about uh, this stuff is that you don't have to understand it. You just need to understand that there's something worth understanding and you can, in your own time, seek another route to try and get to it. But I've, I've, I've had people actually seeing a hyperboloid made with elastic strings being formed from a cone, two cones to a, uh, a um, cylinder. I don't know why I'm gesturing, only the front row can see it. Uh, and still not getting it. It's like a spatial thing is happening in front of them, a four-dimensional uh, occurrence, and it's just not, not clicking. Well, it certainly clicked with Gaudi. And I'm going to talk very briefly about how we reconstructed this window from his broken fragments. Now, what we're looking at here is a, a se selection of hyperboloids of revolution that have been intersected. And these lines are the lines of intersection. And these points here, such as this one, are triple points because three lines of intersection are meeting. So when the two directors said to me they knew what Gaudi wanted to do, they wanted to intersect these surfaces, um, and they didn't know how he did it other than by hand with modeling. And that's the process I'll quickly show you. But um, my job was to draw this window and find a way to make the models more quickly. And I was given a week to come up with a method. So I knew about the surfaces because they'd shown them to me. I could see this model. So I, this is a photograph of the model before it was smashed. And I was given pieces of smashed up model to, to work with. And there was this process to be inspired by. So here is the hyperbola being rotated around Plaster Paris. And so we have, for the last few years, run this uh, part, as part of the After Gaudi um, workshop that um, Areti referred to. Um, these uh, hyperbolic hyperboloids of revolution, where you make the thing you don't want to get the thing you do want, and then you cut them up to get these triple points. And so I was supposed to find a way through uh, this before, this is well before computers, as you'll see from the dates and the drawings. I was supposed to find a way to actually predict what the hyperbolas needed to be in order to get these windows to intersect. So here is the first of the windows being made from the material. And it was actually when I realized um, the first time what innovation is about. And innovation to me is the uh, taking a, a, a service or a technique or a product or a theory from one context, the context that it was designed for, and trying it out in another. And I realized that as long as I was thinking as an architect, I had no hope of solving this because I hadn't been given any descriptive geometry at, 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 um, at my university. But I had realized um, that geographers deal with this. So if I treated this as a landscape, like this mountainscape, there's tri triple points there. All mountainscapes are triple points from lines of intersection. And um, so there's the, the, the primary materials working from. 
That's, uh, yep. And that's the my working environment. I had to do three drawings at once. I was doing plans effectively uh, at what's well, front on, end on, and side on, and using a slide rule because we didn't even have calculators at that time. And I was making maps. These are contour maps. Each of these rings is a distance from the center of the page. And we did it by hand. They look like computer drawings before computers even existed. How about that? And I'm, I'm very, because I'm getting aged now, I'm very proud of the fact that I'm the only person who's ever worked on the building in an analog way, as well as uh, by digitally. And as you'll see in a minute, I think this gives me particular insights, which is when I'll steer the conversation into uh, AI. So I'll just show you, and then we, we, here's the working drawings. We had to invent our own way of, uh, of sharing the information. So there is the hyperbola for the model makers. And there is the schema, which shows where all the surfaces belong relative to each other. Now, I definitely don't want you to know all about how to make a window in the way Gaudi did, but I do want you to appreciate just how subtle this is. Um, if we look at um, hyperbolic paraboloids, I think this is... So this is the um, first story of the roof of the Sagrada Familia. So in 1998, we're now using parametric software. And that one drawing allows the whole of the first story of the roof to be built. And all it was was coordinates and uh, representative lines in space. So here you can see this second um, surface, the hy hyperbolic paraboloid. There's the A3. The whole thing is just from this. And it's made it with millimeter accurate accuracy. And you can see why it's accurate. I mean, that that is your high uh, parabola there. And the, the nicks where the strings go, that's not like it's approximate, they're exact. And then you just build underneath those strings uh, a false surface, just a couple of centimeters below it. Some branding, brand positioning there, I think. Um, and you can see, just sorry, uh, I can't speed this up. Why oh, put me back in? like paint drawing isn't it uh, so there's the strings and then what happens is there you can see the false um, there's the false surface underneath it and where the string is um, a lines of wet plaster have been laid and then that piece of wood and then a pencil line has gone in there and they're now shaving back so when this guy's finished there'll be these knife edges and then you'll see how that gets finished so there's the making the, the knife edges. And that's the, the finished object. I've never seen them actually making that, but I do have a bit of video of... Uh, so that's all made from one A3 drawing at a time when people still regard drawings as being the... the primary means of communication. Now here you can see this idea of the, the, the straight edge. So all that's doing is rocking around, following the little knife edges that are there. That couldn't get easier could, than that. This is to make the molds for that um, thing. And then just to see how this all played out, in, in this case, we're looking at each of these surfaces has nine variables, nine parameters you can alter. But all we're doing is changing this one. We're just rocking it gently on that axis. And this one is rotating on a slight angle off the vertical. And you'll see just how these two small adjustments of the nine for each lead to extraordinary variation. And the point of this is that Gaudi never had these tools. How on earth was he able to make in those 12 years models with the precision that he had without this? And you can see what, what's at stake. Because, I mean, there's, every one of these is a solution. So there's nothing... I mean, where, where, where you see that happening, that's just rhino not behaving, so don't take any notice of that. But you see, that's a solution. That's a solution. That's a solution. But if you look at this curve there, that's not a very good solution, is it, compared with 
other states of it, you can see it gets very um, voluptuous. Where is it? Somewhere down here. And he was doing all this in his mind. And he would have been saying, this angle, you know, these dimensions, because the models themselves take weeks and weeks and weeks to make. Right, no AI, no computation. I'm going to go straight into um, bypassing everything we did after that. I'm going to look at a space that exists, but you probably don't know that it's there. Um, if you've been in the Sagrada Familia, uh, if you're standing down in the um, center of the crossing and looking up, you're looking up and admiring these vaults at 60 meters above you, which that's a, an extraordinarily high that's a vault. But above that, there's a flying saucer that's suspended in space, and it's called the Sala Crowe, which just means the room above the crossing. And the um, I'm just going to talk, talk about it a bit. Um, more for the AI than you might imagine. So here is the original uh, published drawing in the books uh, that came out. But, um, so this was done before Gaudi died, so it's under his supervision, if not by him personally. And he has hatched out the attic space. So immediately there's there's you know a, a conversation in the office. What does this mean? Does this mean that he doesn't think that attic spaces are worth anything? You know, so he's not going to bother, or is it just simply for expediency? He wanted to give people what they needed as quickly as possible, which was a center, sense of the interior. That's the line I go for, and um, and I think that was the prevailing view. But we can see in um, for instance, Bella's Guard, it's, it's a private house. That's not an attic space. It's just been left hatched out. It's been, you know, it's beautifully constructed, even to the extent that weight has been um, reduced where possible through and cost by getting the bricks to... And there's, uh, of course, Casa Mila La Pedrera. That's the roof there. That hasn't been just hatched out. So why would we just hatch out um, and do nothing in particular? So uh, the, the team view was it would be a, um, a, a, a space where people would gather up to 200 while they're waiting for their term to go up to the top of the building. So the, the green things are the evangelist towers that were finished last year, and the central space is the main tower, which will be finished um, quite soon. And it's also the first time that we um, looked at, at having a shared 3D model. Because believe it or not, in... 2005, nobody shared 3D material. They shared, two, you could collaborate on 2D drawings, but um, only engineers actually, like, like aeronautical engineers and shipbuilders, in our experience, were able to share 3D material in real time. So this is the, the sketch model that led to um, the solution. Um, I, I, I thought it was a pity to close the space off. It seemed better to have it so light can come into the space and come through underneath and illuminate the um, the, the vaults that are, uh, that are there. So this space is built, um, and you're going to see it shortly. Um, this is my favorite. When I'm asked if there's one image that sums up my Sagrada Familia experience, it's this one. It's um, an engineer and an architect colleague talking in the powerhouse of decision-making, which is in the in the, um, the model making workshop as it used to be. And you can see here a complete uh, mixture of, of media. So we've got, in those days, it was a wax 3D print. We've got the um, provisional tubes here, cardboard, uh, original Gaudi model and, and, um, and, and approximate model to make a decision on whether or not we need these four columns in the middle. And unfortunately, it turned out we did, but there you go. So there's our modeling environment using uh, um, uh, Katia, that's um, a, uh, you know, an, a, an aeronautical engineering package. And each one of these is somebody's packet of work. So that's the evangelist tower. Um, uh, that's the, um, the roof meeting the, the, the window. And uh, for the first time ever, instead of waiting for months for a model to emerge from our drawings in less than a week we could have three versions this is 2007 so 15 years ago state of the art then we couldn't believe that you could actually do three versions in a week and then uh, choose which one you're going to go with i felt 
that um, the Colonia Guell, which we started with, is Gaudi's best building, um, but not its most important, best building because it was a, he had um, a blank sheet of paper when he started and he went for a Baroque um, solution with a central uh, altar. Whereas with the Sagrada Familia, he was given a building that had already started. It was in the Gothic revival Latin cross, so he had no choice but to follow it. So it's great that he was able to give voice to his um, sculptural talent, but still constrained within the strictures of a, of, a, of a language. So I had a bit of fun in making the Salo Corale more Baroque than anybody realizes. I, I, I'm not sure who knows that it's got curved windows in it. But um, I have always been interested to know what Gaudi might have done had he had the tools. And the way he made his windows were always uh, contingent on a flat plane so that he, he had no choice but to make the windows this way. Can you imagine trying to not only come up with the surfaces that are going to intersect, but actually try and have, do this in space? So whereas with um, everything being robotized by this point, we could do curved windows and that gives the space a, a, a kind of plastic quality, uh, the plastic in the sense of the Van Doesburg, over and above what otherwise would have happened. So there's the model and there's the interior of it. So this is where we are now guilty uh, as charged of not following Gaudi's plan. So from my point of view, I had 20 years as an apprentice where I was re uh, reverse engineering models that he had made at a scale of one to 10 and one to 25. But after that, we'd run out of bits of models. So we were interpreting. So this is an interpretation. And um, you could think there were other, many other ways of doing it. But this is the one that we ran with. And using, at the time, Australia's best renderer, there was a lot of consternation in the office about, well, would it be bright enough? Would there be enough light? And we could just, we could get this most amazingly accurate um, effects on the, um, on metal and glass, but not on the actual fabric. So pleased to say the interior doesn't look anything like this, but you can see how we wanted the building to work. It has a glass floating walkway underneath, and then you can come in at the top as well. And then we built it. So um, normally I would digress and talk about the innovation in off-site construction, but I'm actually wanting to get onto AI very, very soon. Uh, so soon it's not funny. Um, so that's what we have just shown you, this, this hatch space there. That's it in context of the whole building. And here it is emerging. And it took years and years and years to build, and we didn't know until the very last minute when the scaffolding disappeared whether it was, in fact, light enough. I always said, you know, don't worry about it. Of course, it will be fine. Um, but I, no way of knowing. But as it happens, it is fine. There it is. So it's very interesting. I've now got um, two minutes left, which I think is enough. If I can stretch it slightly. Can I? Okay. Um, right. Well, because now we're getting onto the AI. It's enough for, enough, it's enough for play, is it? We can get onto the real deal. Right. So, um, we got some money from the Australian government to, to run a project called Place and Parametricism. We were very disturbed by the fact that parametric design, which um, works very well and very effectively, you get a lot more out of your day, but how do you para parameterize qualities? Right? And place, of course, if you look at how you define a place, dimensions is only one small part of it. There's all these other things. And we used as a, um, a source a trilogy by a guy called Mervyn Peake, um, who um, was a book illustrator, but he wrote a few books, including two and a half volumes from his three-volume trilogy on the Gormenghast series about the House of Grown, who were in their sort of 50 something generation. So they went back a thousand plus years, living in a castle called Gormenghast that's so big that nobody had ever 
um, been uh, or, uh, had seen it all. It wasn't mapped. There were bits of it that they didn't even know what you know was there. Uh, and the reason it's important was for us is that Mervyn Peak in every sentence could give a sense of quality uh, in his words that architects would struggle with um, making. Uh, for instance, when the library, which I'm about to show you, caught fire in a dastardly act, um, when Peake talks about going to the library the next morning when it's you know, smouldering ashes, he describes the burnt books as corpses of... Which if you imagine a pile of ash that had been a book and what it might, its contents might have been, and now it's this corpse of thought. You can see why we thought this book was such a rich source. So the students, uh, not students, three uh, recently um, um, qualified architects who are super talented, we gave them the task of reading the chapter about the library and trying to build um, 3D models that we are printing um, and also to give uh, a sense of its interior. Uh, I think they did a pretty good job because a lot of the textures and things are from the games industry and therefore very uh, flat, which is unhelpful if you're trying to get a bit. And you might be thinking, well, why on earth would you do this when you've got uh, Dali and Mid Journey? Uh, which is the question we are asking ourselves. So these are just some samples from it. There's three um, of them. Uh, that's, you know, a. Uh, uh, a, a day shot and a night shot. And here's what took 10 uh, seconds yesterday. Um, that's not this one. I've got some better ones. I didn't have time to. But I mean, so it's difficult to argue in defense of three young designers spending two years uh, researching libraries, um, reading the book, and building the models, and and everything when you can do this, right? We all agree on that. It sort of sucks if you, if that's what you want to do. You want to make models of libraries um, the hard way. So, of course, I thought, well, if it can do that, what can it do for the Sala Kraue? Right? So that, I mean, most people have only seen it through this image and they think it's got some qualities in it. It's, it's, it's not Gaudi, Gaudi, but it's it's pulling heavily on the um, the training. And this is what um, Mid Journey and Dali think it is. Man, we've tried. I've gone everywhere. I've gone to the best people. You know, the people who bo boast that there's nothing they can't do using this stuff. And seriously, it's it's seriously interesting output. So no 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 complaint. Uh, and the reason I did this is because um, when I first did it myself, and I thought, okay, well, I'm obviously not a very good AI person because I was getting all these very strange outcomes. I was describing the space very, very de you know, detailed with the columns, everything you saw. I literally just looked at it and described it. Uh, but I also called it a lantern because that's what it is, a, a space in the middle of a, a church or basilica that gets light into the middle. It's called a lantern. And, of course... All the results I was getting were, and I used the word interior, I would be pictures of a gothic looking lantern taken from ground level, from outside. And then I realized if I put the word interior in every single sentence, eventually it sort of gave up and tried to produce some interiors. I realized the data source for lanterns is going to be 99.9% tourist shots from the street because how many tourists have got helicopters that take them up inside and take snapshots inside the lantern if you try and look for interior shots of lanterns in you know just from a photo search you're not going to find much and um, but on the other hand if you um, uh, are relying on tourist shots from the streets of Ely or Burgos or somewhere plenty and that's why uh, it's not coping if you google Salakraue you'll find there's about two pictures um, in the world of it. Uh, and that's because they did have a, a press opening when, they, when it was finished. And it, then I think they decided to keep it back from publicity until it's ready to serve as the collector for the thing on the top. Right, I think my, my point's clear, eh? I don't have to... 
it's basically the thing's only as good as its training data, which is only as good as the creative output from human beings to date. But when you actually give it a task to do, where you're saying you've got free license, you've got full agency, give me something that's like the one I've just shown you that we, we did ourselves. And you, you could argue, well, it'd be much better if we had built this. You know, what were we, you know, the mediocrity was you know, disastrous. We could have had this kind of output. But I would argue that what we did is scholarly, it's um, authoritative, and it's got rigor because it's not an image, it's actually spatial, and it's, um, dare I say it, multi-dimensional beyond the three dimensions. So that is almost it. I'm going to flick to another medium. Um, so I have tried to, are you seeing, what are you seeing? Are you seeing my um, boring slides? Um, I don't use PowerPoint. Um, oh, that doesn't do too well, does it? Um, right, so you're seeing a picture, is that right? Not what I'm seeing. All right, so um, artificial intelligence, it's its just talked about it all the time. Everybody talks about it. There are, there are you know, giants in our community like Neil Leach who can talk about it with great profundity. And then there's people like me who are only interested in what's it going to do for me? How am I going to get more out of my day? Am I going to lose my job? So these, these are the sort of the typical... Um, you know, I'm not, you know, artificial intelligence, more than just one thing, you know, it's actually several things. It's uh, expert systems, neural networks, and, you know, virtual reality. But um, if you dig into it, which I did, um, and try and work out what it is and what it means for designers, um, it, it's very interesting. Uh, starting with what is architecture, and this is my antidote when, when parents say to me, or... Oh, yeah, Johnny wants to study architecture, but I've heard it doesn't pay very well. And I say, what's that got to do with anything? Who else gets to do all these subjects? And that's why it's a five-year course, not a three-year course. And, um, and I do, I really believe that's what makes arch architecture so wonderful. Now, bringing it back to Gaudi is that we can go around this and give ourselves marks out of 10 for any of these things, like building technology. Yep, I'd give myself a nine. Uh, computers and architecture, 10 probably. Construction management, probably three. But I reckon Gaudi could go around this and give himself a 10 on nearly every one of them. He's the most holistic architect that I have come across, and I've worked with many of the great architects of our time, and I, you know, I take my hat off to them all, but I don't know anybody who could just do all of this. And um, uh, going into um, uh, urban design, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's a lot of subjects. And no wonder it's, um, we're struggling in Australia because it's usually just the planning that gets the gig. And we know what they do. They think in 2D. So artificial intelligence. When I um, wrote a, a, the first chapter for a book on AI and how it might affect urban design, I wrote and found, I looked into it deeply as I could as a kind of amateur to find out just what is artificial intelligence? How does it manifest itself? So this is what I have... I mean, there's obviously a lot more, probably, but this is, I, I sent it out to experts, and they said, yeah, that's a, that's a fair go at it. And then I decided, well, some of them must be more important to us than others. And on the right-hand side, you can see the red ones. They're the ones I think, yeah, they're, yeah, baby, you know, let's have a bit more of that. And then as it goes round to clockwise to here to soft robotics, you know, machine translation, I don't think they're quite as important. But already this diagram's out of date. I, I, I showed this to Zaha's office uh, just a month ago and realized to my horror that virtual personal assistant, which I thought would be the least useful to an architect, well, we're all using it with chat GPT. Isn't it? That's what we've got. So that's why we have to be pretty open-minded. Anybody who's resolutely not using chat GPT, good on you. But if you are, you've got a... a um, because uh, uh, that's how I use it. It's just I give it the tasks I would usually give to a student to do, uh, so I don't have to pay for it. Limbs <laughs> to breaks. Final slide. Promise you. Where's this? You know, what's this got to do with anything? Uh, I um, have a very brilliant PhD candidate. Many, but I've got one particular one who is an expert in um, computer science because he did a computer science degree in eight years of software development. Then realised saw the light as we should all do, and wanted to do all those disciplines and became an architect. 
and then he did his master's as well. And now he's doing a PhD, uh, looking at um, how we might embrace AI. And um, so our paper, um, which was in Acadia two years ago, was called Staring into the Skid. And the term that Jeff's using is the idea of arbitraging human and artificial intelligence. So I, I um, can give copies to anybody who wants this, but basically on the left-hand side, I, I, I show what is a reasonably non-contestable distillation of a traditional uh, workflow for architects. This was done in urban design because that's what that hat I was wearing at the time, but it's like, it's just, you know, you just change the words. Over to the, um, this column here, the second one from the left, now, the fully digitized planning and urban design services workflow. Again, that could be the architectural so, uh, so, um, workflow. You can see there's more fluency between the digitalized versions of what we used to do and, and analog. But over here, I, I can see a uh, big change coming. So I'll just, my last words, because this is what I'm convinced, is a large part of the architect's role in the future is going to be helping the client to give a better brief to the architect. So it really doesn't matter what AI does or doesn't do. If you've got a, a way of helping the client understand what they really, really want, as opposed to what they think they want, then we're all going to benefit. That's it. Thank you, Mark. It's always a pleasure, not only a pleasure. I think you have been annoyed by listening to your voice back. Uh, it's not always a pleasure, but uh, like a master class, no? We always learn um, from your lectures. And I have seen you talk so many times um, about Sarada Familia, and it's always almost like a new talk. And and I really, I really think that you have a provocative end of the talk, and I hope that maybe we can take it a bit further with the questions. Um, and um, we have a bit of time to take advantage of Mark being here and, and share some questions with him. So please, any, anybody just raise your hand. Thirsty and hungry. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, in the beginning, you were talking about simple. Sorry, I wrote it down. Simplexity and complexification. I wonder if you can kind of explain what that means because I don't understand. Right, yeah, but, well, just before you get the book. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so, some complexification is. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a word. But it is my term. My, it's my term for people who see one of the problems with um, in the '90s when suddenly we could do really extraordinary things spatially on modelling software. You had a very strange situation because you had senior faculty, people like me, who had never seen a computer before. So they either thought this is the holy grail, it's what we've been waiting for, and embraced it uncritically or they did everything possible to resist it. And as recently as three years ago, we had a, a university in Australia that refused to join one of our grant um, you know, funding grants because they were still using butter paper and T-squares. Unbelievable. Um, because they want people to know how architects used to work. Now, the trouble with that, um, that fizzy stuff in the 1990s and, uh, and, and the 2000s was um, the uncritical... Uh, senior faculty would say to someone, well, that looks amazing. I don't know how you did it, but it just looks amazing. And so all sorts of ridiculous stuff was appearing. I uh, introduced a term, term called the um, uh, Mark Barry test of repeatability. I, I put the Mark Barry in front of it to own it. Because my line was, if you, if you get something that looks really spectacular on your screen, but you can't repeat it, it means you don't know how you did it, which means you can't actually adjust it. It's sort of anti-parametric. Now, that's what complexification is. I think we have a whole bunch of architects and buildings 
for a decade or two, which were way more complicated than they need to be, because you could. You know, so even though, like if I built a house for myself, it's never going to look like a Gaudi house. It will look like an anal sort of uptight late modern because that's you know, simple is best for us. You know. But that wasn't the, um, you know, there was a time. Simplexification is what happens, and it's a computing term, where you can actually start pulling away the complicated parts. So you strip away the stuff that isn't really doing much. Now, I'll finish with um, an example. When I wrote code, um, and I still had a brain that could function in that way, um, I would write 10 pages and then give it to my guru friend, Peter Wood, who was an engineer and just seriously out, out there. And he would take my 10 pages and reduce it to a third of a page, which was insulting enough, except that when I actually looked at his third of his page, I didn't know how it worked because it was using terms that weren't even in the, um, in the code book. Because somehow he knew how to find other, you know, esoteric bits of code that he could put in there, which would do the, all that work. That was simplexification. Because it didn't run any better than my own code. It's just that if anybody else wanted to operate with the code itself, they, and they knew the, the you know, esoteric bits, they could, um, they, could, they could tackle it. Whereas they'd have to dive through 10 pages of my gut. And... Um, wasn't pretty. So that's 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 what I, I hope. Does that answer the question, please? Yeah. You're a complexifier. Thank you. <laughs> Any other question? Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah, I really liked the presentation, and I'm also a big fan of hyperboloids. My class knows it. Um, yeah, I was wondering: is still uh, does Sagrada Familia still work with uh, volunteers, or? Um, well, we've got Oriol here. I, I, I think it, it, it. What happened to us? Because I was there for 37 years, and um, so the, the we did the the last things we did. We did the Narthex above the um, passion facade in the cellar Crowe, which I've shown you. What I'd love to show you is the, the main facade, because that was the main thing we did. And I'm, I'm, I, I, I sort of don't need to show it, so I don't, because it, it's, it's polemical, because of, it doesn't fit on site properly. And, but also, there was quite a lot of disagreement. Um, and then this was, the title of my talk was, um, could we use AI to understand Gaudi's models better? But there's so little material left for the glory facade. He never, um, he, he did make a model of it, but it, it, from my point of view, as someone who studied the way he worked using analog model making, I just know that what he did was primitive. It was not, it was the first of what would be a, a whole set of iterations. So the, the, so the dilemma is, do you stick to that primitive model because that's all we have and it's the, it's the genuine Gaudi or do we extrapolate in the way that we did with the Salo Croe? Um, but why am I talking about the glory facade? Can't remember. Um, the hyperboloids. Yes. So, um, so what happened is once once we handed that model over at one to twenty five. That's so the the glory facade exists somewhere as a one to twenty five scale model. But um, I think they're going to be rethinking um, the, the plan of attack. And my understanding from a, a source yesterday is that the office has got smaller. Because um, before, that there was a lot of reliance on university, particularly at UPC, and, um, and our, 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 our operation overseas. But I think now it's about um, work packages. Um, so you need to find out who, if, if you want to actually participate, you need to find out who, who is in the teams that are being commissioned to take these packages through to completion. It's a different way of working. I don't think it's my cup of tea for the Sagrada Familia. I think the for decades I used to talk about the Sagrada Familia as look, surely architects, engineers, cost people, um, uh, and builders, shouldn't they all be in the same team? Shouldn't we be round the table for every single decision, which is what that building represents? But I think that's 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 no longer the it's not it's not seen even when I was there towards the end, it wasn't seen as an efficient way of working.
I, I'm just a little confused about, you mentioned the fourth dimension, but like, which one? Because I, 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 I don't know if it's me, but I just did not understand what you meant with that. Okay, let's, let's, let's start with the hanging model. What do you think the fourth dimension might be? Yeah, I don't know. I would assume time, no? But yeah, well, displacement. So in, in, in my book, I talk about the principle, um, because the fourth dimension could be anything you like. It could be color. You know, it's, 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 all, it's all arbitrary. Three dimensions is just a Cartesian um, simplification of a, of a concept of space so that we can communicate what we mean. Um, and the fourth dimension could be anything. But I think in the context of the hanging model, most things that architects do, certainly in the non-Euclidean sense, um, it's, it's displacement. And that comes right, you know, right down to robots. How does a robot do its operation? We're not interested in the robot just in space here now. We're interested in what it does with the tool because it moves it from there to there. And that's, the, that's a vector. <coughs> that's a time function. So generally, when I'm talking about the fourth dimension, I'm thinking about movement and displacement, and that's a time function. And it's important in talking about the uh, Colonia Guell Chapel because he wasn't drawing it. He couldn't draw it. I, I, it was an undrawable building, and it, he needed a dynamic model that would respond to forces to gravity. Is that, is that an answer that meets your needs? Yeah. Great presentation. Thank you very much. And then I was actually want to ask you something about your last point about artificial intelligence. And I wonder if it's in your opinion, it will be a win or a loss in the future of our profession. Let's talk about maybe within the two to five years. Not, I mean, having an artificial intelligence to be able to do, not exactly what you do, right, of course, but be able to learn 20 years from Gaudi and replicate it, that action, it's a win or it's a loss for our profession? Um, it's a loss if you do that. Right. So if you say, shit, I can't design. No idea. Uh, but my client wants my ha the house to look like a Gaudi house, so I'll get a huge... Um, source of Gaudi images and I'll do my training from that and then I'll get my, my, my pay. So that's what I call the enfranchisement of the amateur. So if you're a lazy architect or an incompetent architect or untalented or not an architect at all, that's the danger of AI. But if you're a very good architect, you're still going to have an idea ahead of the machine. But if you are a good architect who wants to make a profit, you will then use AI any way you can to deliver the project. But you will, it, I, I, you know, when you look at real great architecture, you, you know that it can't come out of it. You know that it's some amazing person around us has had an idea. That's why I started with the idea. And I, I just think ideas will come from us first. It partly as a human response to, in ways that machines can't. I mean, machines will average things out. Or if you say, oh, I want a sentiment analysis, uh, it's got to be soulful building, it will try and work out what soulful is, you know, and put a soul, soulful, soulful parameter in the mix. But we, we don't work like that, I don't think. So, so I think um, the short answer is uh, untalented architects who don't watch out will lose their, lose their position, but talented architects will just get better. Hi, uh, thank you for your <laughs> thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering how, because you've worked with traditional architecture and uh, now you're going into AI, how do you balance the two without making one of them feel uh, lesser com in comparison to the other? <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a younger person's um, world. My world is to say these five access routers, these 3D earth printers uh, that we have in the in the labs, and we have you know people with PhDs sort of coming up with the ideas and all the rest of it. But my university actually has a trade school attached to it. So all the plumbers and electricians and the carpenters learn their trade. And one quarter of the third year are bored out of their boxes um, by it all. They want to know what they're going to do that's going to make a difference. And going to work for Uncle's plumbing company or 
aunties, electricians, it do doesn't really do it for them. They actually want to be involved in something which is going to change the world. So what we're doing is upending the whole thing and saying, what if you actually put the trades in the driving seat and you put the university people, the researchers with PhDs, into a support role? And then what if you built a facility um, in the city where remote community members, motivated remote community members, can come down and learn how to use... Because we know from EAC that all this machinery, it's not like, it's not easy, but it's not impossible. We've got all the students who use them know that it... Why can't that be members of community? So that's where I'm putting my energy. Can't see AI getting involved in that too soon. So my interest in AI is intellectual, um, and I'm trying to keep a, an eye on things. But my personal focus is to get into, is to get this technology into remote communities and get self-building back into the equation so that you have what we call sweat equity. You know, costs are reduced enormously if you combine technology with not having to use a, a contractor. It's not really answering your question, but it's, it's, it's my way of avoiding it. Um, to go off the evening, but I think um, what is most interesting uh, also from this talk is to, as you have been saying, is to always try as a um, complete professional, let's say, or a talented person to be able to balance in which moments of your practice or of your approach, each tool or its medium is necessary for achieving, you know, certain goals. And one goal could be in relation to make buildings much more accessible in terms of economy, but other goals might be to expand um, creativity or to expand inspiration. I think one of the most interesting thing that technologies do in general, not only AI, but all the technologies related to the digital design and, and fabrication is exactly giving us this possibility to innovate also and create um, ways, methodologies, final products that would have been impossible otherwise. And I really appreciate this talk from you today. Mark, thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you, everybody, for joining us in this very, very lovely evening. Thank you. <laughs>